Well, hello there. Uh, my name is Jana and this is my YouTube channel. Welcome. Um, this video is in particular uh, from the series of books and makeup, which my friends jokingly call books and looks. I don't really uh, confront that. Um, <laughs> we see how it goes. Um, and this is the first time I'm recording a video in English uh, because um, I've read this book, which I'm going to review uh, today in English, and it was only fair uh, to review it also in, in English. Uh, the book is called The Bear and the Nightingale by Catherine Arden. I received this book as a birthday gift, which is very nice. I must say that I had never heard of the author, nor had I heard of the book before, so it was a totally fresh introduction for me to the author, to the style of writing, and to the setting. Yeah, without further ado, let's dive into it um, and get it rolling. So, based on my rather superficial and initial research about the author, um, and the background of the book. Uh, Catherine Arden is an American writer. She resides in Texas, um, in the States, uh, where she also studied and she majored in Russian and in French. Um, I believe after high school, she spent a year in Moscow. I'm not sure how fluent her Russian is, uh, she sprinkles the Russian words all over this book here and there um, and they seem to be in their um, rightful positions there and they seem to be rather appropriate so I, I only assume that she might be she might be rather fluent in Russian. It is all to say that the book is actually set in the medieval Russia and it is heavily based on the folklore um, of Russia and on the Russian mythology. Um, we actually meet at the beginning of the book, we meet this family who live in the wilderness of the northern Russia, of the northern Rus. And this family consists of the father, uh, his wife, um, so the father's name is Peter, uh, his wife's name is Marina, they have four children, um, and also a nanny lives with them, a nanny called Dunya. Uh, lives with them who takes care of the children and occasionally in the evening um, tells a fairy tale um, to get kids to bed. So at the beginning of the book, the wife Marina announces to her husband that she is pregnant again with their fifth child. And Peter, the father, doesn't know what to make out of this announcement because his wife seems not to be as young anymore. Uh, she's, she grew rather weak that particular winter, uh, the beginning of the book is setting, um, and also she seems not very healthy and she might not have enough strength in her body really to make it through um, with this pregnancy. But, the, but Marina is very sad to bring this child uh, to see the light of day because she believes that it's going to be a girl and she's going to be as her mother. Uh, Marina's mother uh, was Russian Tsar's wife who rode to Moscow on a horse and really caught Tsar's attention with her wild spirit and tamed uh, nature. Um, and she was rumored to be a witch. So Marina believes that the child she's bearing uh, is going to be a girl and she's going to possess the same magical powers as her grandmother did. So the time comes and Marina gives birth to, to the child. It is indeed a girl who is named Vasilisa. Uh, and unfortunately Marina dies while giving birth to Vasilisa. Vasilisa grows uh, up among her siblings. Uh, she loves them dearly. Uh, she also, of course, adores her father and the nanny Dunyasha. Um, she is as well-spirited um, and untamed as her 
uh, grandmother actually rumored to be. She likes to run to the forest. Uh, she knows her ways there. She actually feels there like home. Um, and even as a small child, uh, she would just wander there and come back to dinner, um, come back home for dinner. Uh, but she never uh, seemed to get lost there because, uh, you know, she knew that as well as, as the izba, the hut they, they're living in. But time passes um, and Father Pertr decides to go to Moscow uh, to get a new wife and bring her uh, to, this, to this distant uh, village. Uh, in the northern Russia, because he feels that his children um, are motherless and they actually need a stepmother to look after them, and especially the youngest, Vasilisa, uh, needs a female attention and a female hand to be helped uh, to be raised and to be well-bred, uh, to become, uh, to be nurtured, to become a good mother and a good wife to some peasant he's gonna, she's going to marry one day and uh, bear strong ch children uh, for, for her husband. But currently it seems that all she's thinking of is actually her walks in the forest um, and, and the berries and the nuts and, and the horses. All the while, all the wild things the forest has to offer. So after attending the court uh, in Moscow, Peter gets as lucky as to bring uh, his new wife uh, to this remote village the family is living in, and this wife is uh, no one but a princess, Anna, who is fiercely devout, city bred, uh, strictly and strongly religious. Uh, the only thing that seems to be a little bit off with her is that she can't really build close contact or close relation with her new husband uh, because she always seems a little bit unsettled and wary um, and almost like frightened of, of something. Um, so, in fact, it turns out that Anna, the new wife of Peter, uh, is actually able to see all different spirits and demons that are looking in the corners um, and that find refuge in the darkness. However, um, contrary to her experience in Moscow, where the demons and spirits would just be visible, visible to her, but wouldn't, you know, almost like it seems that they would ignore her or not really notice her existence here in this remote village um, her new husband takes her to uh, these spirits actually look back at her and stare almost curiously and she can't really continue with her normal life because it it's it's a very unsettling thing to have um, and she can't really get on with her normal life uh, she doesn't really know what to make of Vasilisa, the youngest stepdaughter, uh, because she is untamed, she is wild, she is mysterious. Something is absolutely off uh, about her, thinks Anna. And she can't really get herself to, to even like this Vasilisa. And as we go further down the tropes that laid in the book, we discover how Vasilisa grows up um, in this setting and how time comes for her to get married and Peter finds a suitor for her. Um, uh, we also find how the, the magic powers she, she was set to possess, um, in the words of her dead mother, actually come true and actually claim their, their right over her. Um, and we also meet different characters uh, from the Russian mythology and the Russian folklore um, whom mistakenly the stepmother Anna uh, was calling the demons. However, it is a rather strong word for this, for these characters. Um, not all of them, but most of them. So in parallel with talking about 
uh, different spirits and folklore and mythology characters. I'm trying to tame the best of the pigments on my eyelids, which is a task of its own. Uh, so I can't really concentrate uh, on either when talking and putting them on my eyelids. So I'm trying to do that somehow in, you know, step by step and one by one. So this, <laughs> this eyelid is done. I'm going here, but let's see if I manage to talk and to put it evenly uh, and nicely, because that's not a given. So really, at first, when when we meet the family and we meet this, you know, uh, nanny who tells the fairy tales um, and who brings all these characters, all these fairy tale characters really to life in the book. So. I thought that that would actually go as this setting and we would meet all these, you know, pagan gods and uh, all these folklore um, characters like Domovoy, Lashi, Rusalka uh, and all of those only through the fairy tales of the Nelly, which is a very well-known trope uh, in almost any um, national folklore, I would say, or now retelling of national folklores. But uh, Catherine didn't go this uh, this accustomed trope, and she chose another one, which which I am uploading her for. Um, and she did bring those characters to life on her, um, you know, on the pages of her book, uh, which is not an easy task to do because to breathe life into the characters of this sort. Um, it's almost as retelling yet another story of ancient Greek myth uh, and and to bring all those ancient um, Greek gods to, to life um, in another book. So it might get actually... It, it's a dangerous water to try, really, to navigate through. Um, but Catherine manages rather graciously. Um, I love how those characters are vivid and almost not two-dimensional, that they have some depth to them, that there are sorrows, that there are griefs, that there are joys, and you can actually feel what they're for in the book, and they're just not to bring this folklore fl flavor uh, to it. But more so, I uh, really enjoy how Vasilisa's character is, is written. Because she is, of course, from the first pages, you understand that you would meet this child of Marina. Uh, and we, again, like since the beginning, we know that she's going to possess some magical powers and she's going to resemble this wild, beautiful, um, strong grandmother of hers. But at the same time, when, when we meet Vasilisa first a child and then see, see her grown up and see her becoming a teenager and then a woman, uh, we follow her journey, we love her fears, we love her uh, longings for it. We even see flashes, flashes of, you know, love and desire um, and, um, of course, regrets and doubts and fears. And it's all very refreshing in a, in a strong character that is not weakened by bringing up those fears and those concerns. Because sometimes, you know, in female characters, you have either one. Either they're, like, strong-willed, opinionated and go head-on and don't see any obstacles around them. Or they are set to be somehow building this empowering uh, space around them, but they are uh, always whining and moaning and are dependent on men, etc, etc. It is a very nice, picturesque, a very um, vivid and even tempting language uh, Catherine is writing the book with. Um, and it really, really paints the picture of the wildness, of the cold, um, and you almost fear the kiss of frost on your fingertips and on your toes. Um, you hear the cracks of the ember fire, 
uh, at the far pit, uh, you see almost the looking, you know, faces and spirits and the lingering whispers of the forest um, in the backyard. And it is all greatly set and greatly written with, again, some sprinkles of the Russian words to maybe give that flavor of the folklore. Yet, um, it is very good English, I would say. At least in my opinion, it was very lovely to, to read um, a good quality text uh, and to enjoy the language and enjoy the description. Uh, not only of characters, dialogues, um, people um, and their involvement throughout the book, but also the sceneries, the nature, the change of the seasons. Um, and again, how how subtle, but very sort of strong at the same time is the description of the winter as the dominant force of this book and as a separate reigning character of it as well. So as always, and uh, unavoidable with this pigments, uh, I have like a lot uh, here under the eye, so it all now dazzles <laughs> and twinkles. So I have to um, wipe it off, and then I'll do the whole face, I guess, and then come back for the closing words um, and the closing resume. So this book is a fairy tale. Uh, it is a representative of the magic realism genre and Catherine Arden is said to be influenced, for example, by Tolkien and even Diane Gableton, I guess this is the name of the author of Outlander, which got me a little bit confused, such a mix, but who am I to judge, really? Um, and it is a very enchanting, absorbing, magnetic read. Um, I guess it's a great escapism for anyone who wants to run away from the horrors and maybe some issues of the contemporary world and contemporary times and want just to spend a few evenings in this magical fantasy setting of the medieval Russia and who are not very familiar, familiar with the Russian folklore and uh, with the Russian mythology. At the same time, I think the setting itself um, as in the village, in the remote village in this northern uh, Rus, is very relative. Uh, it can be really anywhere in the world because the characters, the protagonist herself and the supporting characters go through very human, you know, issues and obstacles and situations. They have, you know, very human pursuits really as anyone else. They cherish love for their siblings, for their family, for their dearest, nearest ones, for the animals, for the nature around. There is even a thread of forbidden desire. Um, and there is also a, you know, big symphony of finding your inner voice, of following your guts, of not... Um, um, of not giving up, even though you know, anyone else might be um, against you and they might misunderstand you. Um, there is this uh, strong female character. The protagonist is female, of course, and uh, she opposes patriarchy uh, she is living in because of the times. Um, and she actually suffers from it, but she opposes it in a very natural manner because it is in her core, it is her, in her nature to be this wild and tamed creature. Uh, it is not forced, and um, I guess the whole story, and it is not, you know, for the sake of being there as an empowering female character, but it, but it is very, it, it, it reads very right to the story, um, the whole thing really describes and sets in. Uh, so I would recommend it to anyone really who wants just an escapism book uh, and who's maybe a fan of magic realism and who likes yet another fantasy story to um, to be enchanted with uh, and to spend again a few nice evenings with.
But as a Russian speaking reader, I have to say that, first of all, this book came in very interesting air quotes, um, not the easiest times we're living in. And at first I was just like, wow, someone is interested in the Russian folklore, it seems. And then I looked at the publishing uh, year and it was 2017. Not very rational thing to, to wonder about, I guess, but you know, this is this is the times. Um, it, it is masterfully and craftfully decorated book with the with the figures and characters from the Russian folklore again, um, and it has this interesting theme of re religion versus paganism which I believe is still rather relevant to the contemporary Russia. And I have never been a fan of the Russian fairy tales myself. They seemed rather cruel and less maybe magical as, say, you know, Andersons to me as a child. So I, I didn't really like when someone read them to me or I really... Um, wasn't really an avid reader of them as a kid. But at the same time, uh, I used to spend every summer in my grand grandparents' house in the central uh, Russia, in also a very remote village. And all these, you know, characters from, from the pagan times uh, were always there, you know. And the superstition and, and the traditions prevailed since the, those medieval times. And one would say, hey, don't touch this mirror because it would upset this spirit or don't overstep this door away uh, because that, you know, the other spirit would get, get angry. And um, not very, not many offerings were left, for example, for, for, the, for the pagan, not gods, but creatures, spirits. Uh, but they they really were present in the everyday life, I would say. So that was a really interesting take on something I didn't like as a kid, but I was very much very well familiar with, and I would now understand the connection. And after having read this book, I'm now wondering if I have to maybe research more how how all this actually came into play and how how it was all set uh, to be. So for I would I would also recommend it to the Russian read uh, Russian speaking readers because I think there is a, there is a fresh angle to to look at something we are very much familiar with, and uh, I have to confess that the first pages were not very convincing to me that I thought that oh there is another retelling of Marosca fairy tale again I think I mentioned it and I was just like will the whole book be just retelling of Russian fairy tales I know them very well. Uh, I'm not a big fan of them, like, what is all about? But then the book managed to turn the table and I was enchantedly following the uh, the tropes and the, the paths the characters were taking. I was actually feeling the forest around me, the harsh winter, um, and I almost, you know, s you know, had this illusions of familiar smells uh, and familiar flavors from my childhood times um, in the rural uh, Russia. So it was an enriching experience for me. And um, I do hope uh, that all the magic realism fans would also find um, this interesting and um, a great read, really. Uh, so I do hope that in your everyday life, you find some magic and that, um, you know, escapism can be a little treat. It, it doesn't need to be a big journey to embark on, but it has, can be a little step uh, in your everyday routine, uh, just, to spot, just to, you know, brighten it up. And I do hope everything is well with you. So thank you for watching this. Take care. Bye.